In 1869, this 163 km route reduced London to Bombay travel by 7,500 km. For a long time, the idea of easy travel between the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea captivated many. By the late 1700s, Napoleon's chosen engineer mistakenly believed the sea levels of these two bodies of water differed by 10 meters. However, the reality is that their levels are the same, debunking the long-held belief that locks were essential for a canal, a misconception that lasted nearly 50 years. It wasn't until the latter half of the 1830s that Ferdinand de Lesseps was captivated by the prospect. The French consul in Alexandria was convinced that building the Suez Canal was feasible. Entrepreneurs from England, Germany, Austria, and France meeting in a Paris firm began to agree. They saw a valuable opportunity in this project. Lesseps secured authorization to commence operations from the Ottoman Empire, given that in the year 1854, Egypt was under the dominion of that empire. The French investors were elated, whereas the British felt deeply dismayed, harboring a profound skepticism towards the project as a whole. They regarded it as an utter futility. At first, slave labor was employed, but as time progressed, this method was forsaken. To facilitate a more effective removal of excavated material, a steam-powered railway was constructed. Over time, numerous builders from Europe appeared. About 25,000 workers bravely faced many fever and cholera epidemics. The grand opening on November 17, 1869, was honored by the presence of Emperor Franz Joseph, accompanied by Empress Eugenie, presents an intriguing scene. Remarkably, a decade and three years later, in the year 1882, the British, who were initially doubtful and cautious, acquired a significant number of shares, thus securing full dominance over the Suez Canal. This crucial and strategic point turned into a pivotal element in a conflict destined to unfold in the second half of the 20th century. Now we shall return to the splendid opening ceremony of the canal. What sort of occasion could it have been? The yacht Lygel made its way into the canal's waters. In a setting meticulously overseen by the French Empress Eugenie, spouse of Napoleon III, along with the previously mentioned Emperor Franz Joseph of Austro-Hungary, a significant maritime passage linking the Mediterranean to the Red Seas was inaugurated. That night, the elite of society gathered for a magnificent display of grandeur and opulence, marking an unforgettable event coinciding with the canal's opening at the palace. The Empress was so captivated by the evening's charm that she couldn't resist sending a delighted telegram to her husband, expressing that, in her entire life, she had never witnessed anything similar. In Egypt, everything was satisfactory until the moment the English acquired the shares. Subsequently, Egypt experienced the cessation of monetary inflow into its budget, leaving them with no alternative but to observe the British actions passively. How they shamelessly maximized their gains through their lucrative venture. The British firm was a thorn in the side. Initially, it was a minor annoyance to every Egyptian patriot, which grew increasingly bothersome, until finally some nationalists started to theorize the bothersome stone must be taken away. Egyptian nationalists declared their refusal to endure this condition any longer. On the 26th of July in the year 1956, President Nasser of Egypt took control of the Suez Canal, a whole 12 years prior to the end of its lease, with the aim of securing funds for building the Aswan Dam after the United States had denied him the necessary finances. Until now, this has effectively been an extraterritorial channel, operating under the unofficial control of Britain. The United Nations sanctioned its birth as an international passage, albeit with three stipulations. To begin with, passage through it was to remain unimpeded. In addition, this unobstructed access was to extend to all vessels without exception. Lastly, this arrangement implied that Israeli vessels too would enjoy unhindered navigation, a prospect that was not met with widespread enthusiasm within Egypt. Given that Israel was hardly fond of Egypt, the two nations endured each other's presence until, driven by their stakes in the Middle East, the European alliance of Great Britain and France convinced Israel to launch an assault on Egypt. The strategy was straightforward. Amidst the escalating, sorrowful confrontation, France, alongside Great Britain, aimed to intervene nobly, scold the inappropriate resolution of disputes, and through these discussions, an unsatisfactory, President Nasser's interests in Europe would be eliminated, 
ensuring the canal's control remained intact. As usual with such strategies, everything appeared perfect in theory. The higher-ups congratulated each other. How excellent the plans they believed they had crafted, yet in truth, these plans did not succeed, resulting in glaring disgrace and the persistent taste of defeat. The commencement of what would lead to Britain and France reclaiming control over the Suez Canal was underway. Israeli attack 2956. They swiftly seized control of the Gaza Strip and Sharm el Sheikh through a rapid assault. It was only on the following day that the European leaders called upon both parties involved in the conflict to come to the table. Observing the conflict, the pulling back of military forces, a halt in fighting, and the events of the 31st of October, including the descent of British and French airborne units, played a crucial role in ensuring that, merely a week later, a vanquished Egypt agreed to the ceasefire. However, it's noteworthy that neither the French nor the British resorted to opening bottles of champagne to celebrate. The whole Suez crisis culminated in an utter humiliation for both Paris and London. But why? Two primary causes exist. Initially, it was due to the Russians, followed by the Americans. Moscow explicitly and sternly warned of employing force unless British and French forces retreated. Conversely, Washington appeared unsupportive of its European partners, yet in reality, they were. The American strategy was to denounce the aggressors via United Nations bodies. Ultimately, the effort failed. With their heads lowered in defeat, the United Forces of Britain and France withdrew from the Canal Zone compelling Israel to relinquish the territories it had seized. Egypt emerged victorious, reclaiming sovereignty over the canal, and surprisingly, the Soviet Union found itself with a new ally, particularly after providing assistance to Nasser in the construction of the Aswan Dam. This is largely due to the profitability of the Suez Canal. The annual revenue from the Suez Canal, as estimated by Egyptian officials, is about $5 billion. It's believed that nearly seven-eighths of the world's sea trade notably between Asia and Europe, as well as Asia and the eastern coast of the United States, passes through the Suez Canal. Additionally, this pathway is the primary route for Chinese exports, specifically moving containers and bulk goods shipping, for instance. Between the years 2014 and 2015, Egypt constructed an extra segment of the canal, referred to as the New Suez Canal. This project extended for a distance of 72 kilometers, for around $4 billion, the building of an additional roadway allowed ships to move in both directions at the same time. This advancement cut the average journey time through the canal from 22 to 11 hours and greatly expanded its capacity. Truly grateful you watched or listened. Hope it was enjoyable.